This is ACM ByteCast, a podcast series from the Association for Computing Machinery, the world's largest education and scientific computing society. We talk to researchers, practitioners, and innovators who are at the intersection of computing research and practice. They share their experiences, the lessons they've learned, and their own visions for the future of computing. I am your host, Brooke Kifley. Artificial intelligence has become an integral part of modern society, transforming industries from education, medicine, to law enforcement and finance. More recently, we're seeing the emergence of generative AI technologies like GPT and DALI, further enhancing the potential of AI and revolutionizing the way we interact with you know, technology, the web, and the world more broadly. However, as AI becomes more ubiquitous, there's growing concern about the potential for misuse, for bias, unintended consequences, and harm. Ensuring AI is trustworthy and responsible has become increasingly crucial, with a focus on distributing its benefits fairly and equitably to society at large. In this episode, we delve into the topic of responsible and trustworthy AI and how it can be achieved with Dr. Kush Varshney. Dr. Kush Varshney is a distinguished research scientist and manager at IBM Research in New York. He leads the machine learning group in the Trustworthy Machine Intelligence Department, where he focuses on applying data science and predictive analytics to various fields, including healthcare, public affairs, algorithmic fairness, and international development. He is also the founding co-director of the IBM Science for Social Good Initiative. Dr. Varshney has contributed to the development of several open source toolkits, such as AI Fairness 360, AI Explainability 360, and conducts widely recognized research on trustworthy machine learning. In 2022, he independently published a book called Trustworthy Machine Learning. He received his bachelor's in electrical engineering and computer engineering from Cornell University and master's and PhD degree in ECS from MIT. Dr. Kush Varshney, welcome to ByteCast. Yeah, thanks, Brooke. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, thanks for the invitation. Oh, certainly. You know, I, I'd like to start off with a question that I ask most folks. You know, you've had a very, you know, interesting and remarkable career from, you know, your graduate work at MIT to, you know, your long contributions at, at IBM. Can you describe some of the you know, key inflection points within your you know, personal and professional career that have led you into the field of computing and specifically calling out any experiences or projects that have really sparked your interest in responsible and trustworthy AI research? So I wanted to start actually with a quote. It's a proverb from Sudan, and uh, it says that uh, we desire to bequeath two things to our children. The first one is roots and the other one is wings. And I think both have been important. I think the roots and the wings um, so in terms of roots, um, yeah, so I mean, my family, uh, I mean, over a long period of time has been very much uh, interested in technology, but also kind of in uh, how to make social impact um, in, in various ways. And so I think that's been a big starting point. And then on the wings, just kind of I mean, taking things uh, into the future as best as possible. So let me, I mean, talk through that a, a little bit more. One of my great, great grandfathers actually um, was the first person from India to study at MIT. Um, this was back in 1905. And um, uh, he studied glass making technology. And uh, then he went back to India, used that um, knowledge to uh, start a school and a factory um, for glass making that kind of illustrated to the um, people of India that uh, they can have a self-sustainable industry and uh, use that as a way to um, fight for uh, Swaraj, which was the independence movement in India from the British. And um, since then, uh, I mean, various family members of mine have um, been kind of straddling this technology and social impact sort of uh, space. And um in terms of, I mean, computing, it's always been something where it's kind of like the newer, new technology that I've grown up with and have wanted to contribute to because um, anything that uh, that is up and coming, I think, is uh, the best place to, uh, to to make impact. So, yeah, in college, uh, as you said, I studied electrical and computer engineering at Cornell and um, 
I was drawn more to the kind of mathematical side of uh, of that field, um, just because of uh, I think I was a little bit better at it, um, and uh, it made more sense to me. Um, I mean, uh, electrical engineering is a, is a very broad topic, and so yeah, I mean, I started doing uh, kind of more on the signal processing and um, uh, that sort of side of things, and then. Went straight over to grad school uh, at MIT and kind of got into doing more uh, machine learning over time uh, as an outgrowth of uh, some of the signal processing work. And um, then when I was looking for jobs, uh, I knew I wanted to do research and uh, I was looking for mostly industrial research sort of positions. And uh, this was a time back around uh, late 2009, uh, early 2010, when um, we hadn't yet had uh, kind of the machine learning explosion that we've had uh, in the last 10 to 15 years. I mean, a lot of uh, machine learning specific uh, research groups and, and so forth, um, like there are now, and uh, IBM made a lot of sense to me. So this was uh, just before IBM actually came out with Watson, uh, which uh, won the Jeopardy thing um, and reignited a lot of the uh, the renewed interest in, in artificial intelligence. But the group that I joined, um, uh, led by Sashka Mysolovich, um, was actually doing something quite unique, something I had never even imagined would be possible. Now it's kind of old hat, but um, back then... The group was using machine learning to um, make predictions about um, people in various contexts. Um, so thinking about how, um, how machine learning can be used to uh, improve human capital management, so um, getting employees to um, be better aligned with what they want to do, um, predicting employees at risk of resigning so that we can offer them incentives to stay, uh, various things of that sort. Um, and also uh, looking at uh, the use of machine learning in healthcare. So again, both were things that I had not even imagined uh, were possible, and that was what drew me to the group and uh, and the people as well. And uh, that eventually, I mean, kind of led to where we are today. So when we were working on those people problems uh, with machine learning, it kind of brought up the fact that uh, we need to do a lot of um, explainability and interpretability of the models because these are very consequential decisions and uh, it needs to be clear why they're being made. And then uh, also uh, the fairness aspects of it, um, because it's, uh, I mean, these are, again, consequential decisions. Um, if certain people or groups are being um, systematically disadvantaged, it's not a, a good situation. So all of that kind of started happening. Uh, we kept pursuing things in that direction. And in parallel, a few years after I had started working at IBM, I uh, went back to my roots um, and heard about this organization. Um, it was called uh, Data Kind. Um, actually, r right at the beginning, they were called Data Without Borders, but then they quickly um, changed their name to Data Kind. And it was an organization to connect practicing data scientists, which at that time was a new term by itself, with nonprofits and social change organizations uh, to do applied work. And so, I got to, I mean, work on uh, some really exciting projects uh, with a, with a few nonprofits, and then after doing a couple of those projects, Sashka and I sat down and um, said maybe we can try doing something like this uh, internally at IBM Research. We have all these uh, smart people who are dying to uh, kind of uh, make a social impact, so we started that program and have done uh, a lot of projects um, uh, with various nonprofits uh, addressing poverty and hunger and uh, health and uh, education inequalities of various sorts. So um, all of that came together, um, doing the research, doing the, um, uh, the social good, and then that led to, uh, I mean, the open source toolkits as a way to um, bring things from the lab to uh, practitioners, and then things kind of evolve from there. Um, eventually, the the book as well um, that that you'd mentioned. So, yeah, things have kind of been a natural progression. And yeah, I mean, in terms of uh, inflection points, uh, I think there's some things that uh, I would point out. Um, some th I think it's a mix of things that you choose to do and things that you choose not to do. Um, and people don't necessarily think about, about it that way. So, yeah, I mean, there were points at which um, I had opportunities to leave IBM and do something else, um, which I chose not to do because... Um, 
I felt that the work we were doing uh, here was so important and could be so socially impactful. So, yeah, I mean, I think um, part of it is that and then choosing to take opportunities, start the social good programs, uh, create the open source toolkits, write the book. Um, these sort of things are things that you do choose to do. So, um, yeah, I, I guess the long winded answer to your um, <laughs> question. That's awesome. It seems like, you know, I really like this common theme of social impact that underlies all the work that, you know, you've you've done and continue to do at IBM. And I think in terms of inflection points, it's certainly interesting. I think most folks default to thinking about what actions they have taken to drive them to where they are today, but also thinking about the actions that you chose not to take or the decisions you chose not to make, how that has ultimately led you to your current place is also quite interesting. You know, one thing before we get into some of the actual technical details of, you know, your work in Trustworthy AI, you know, you lead IBM's machine learning group in the, you know, Trustworthy Machine Learning Intelligence Department. Can you explain the concept of trustworthy machine learning or, you know, within the industry we hear, you know, this this term of responsible AI? What yeah. is it and, and why is it important? I think of responsible AI as kind of an overarching umbrella within which we have a few different things. So there's AI ethics. Uh, so that's about kind of thinking about the principles and policies. So what should be done? What would be good and bad? What are the right things to do in using AI in uh, societally consequential um, application domains? Um, then there's trustworthy AI. So this is thinking through how do we take those principles and actually operationalize them? What are the theories and methods and tools that we need to um, go forward and actually do this? And then there's AI governance as a third uh, aspect. So these are more of the um, organizational aspects. So once you have the tools, um, what does it take to actually um, make them part of the uh, the workflows of, uh, of different organizations? And so on the trustworthy machine learning or trustworthy AI side of things, the way I think about it is uh, like, what are the attributes that you need from a person to be trustworthy? And they're kind of the same of what you need from a machine learning system. So you can think about it. Let's say you're like trying to hire a carpenter to work on your house or something. There's probably a few things that you want from that uh, that person for them to be trustworthy. And in the organizational management literature, they've come up with um, several of these attributes. So the first one is that the other person should be competent at what they're doing. So they should be able to do what they say. Second is that they should be reliable uh, so that that competence sticks around in various conditions and various settings. Third is that they should be able to communicate back and forth with you so that you can understand them, they can understand you, and there's some level of intimacy. And fourth is that they should be um, working for goals beyond their own goals, so they should be selfless in some capacity. And uh, all of these exactly map to what we want from machine learning systems as well. So um, a trustworthy machine learning system is uh, competent if it has good predictive accuracy. Um, it's doing what it's supposed to really well. And then in terms of the reliability, there's a few different things. We want um, these systems to be robust to distribution shifts because we know, I mean, COVID gives us a great example. If you have data from before COVID and now yeah. um, there's a distribution shift and you have a model trained on the data, it might not work so well because the world has changed, right? So we want that sort of robustness. We want robustness against uh, attacks. So if there's a malicious actor who's uh, trying to uh, make the system do something that it's not supposed to, we want to make sure that uh, that's not possible or it's difficult. And then uh, fairness comes in here as well. So we want to ensure that our um, AI systems uh, work as equally as possible for different people, different groups, and uh, in different uh, situations. So those are on that second attribute. And then uh, if we come to the third attribute, uh, which is the communication back and forth. So there's a few things where the machine is communicating to us as humans. So that includes interpretability and explainability so that we as people can understand how the model is making its predictions. 
there's uncertainty quantification. So we want the machine to be able to tell us its own limits, what kind of be intellectually humble in a sense. So if it is not confident, it should be able to tell us that it's not confident. And then some sort of broad transparency as well. So kind of uh, throughout the entire development life cycle of that system, where did the data come from? What were the intended uses? Um, what are kind of different uh, processing steps that have been done, what tests have been conducted, um, and release all of that in some sort of transparent documentation, like a fact sheet or a model card. And then there's the other direction as well, right? So um, for us as humans or society to communicate to the machine of what we want, and this is often known as value alignment. And um, you can maybe come back to that um of like what that implies and how it's kind of evolving now that uh we're seeing these uh, very powerful models uh, coming up and so forth um and just to close the loop the fourth attribute of selflessness so using ai for social good for making positive social impact is certainly one thing that uh, i would categorize in that bucket and then also i would say empowering all people no matter what station in life that they're in to be able to use AI technologies for meeting their goals and their purposes. So um, all of that, I think, combines together uh, to make uh, what, what I would call as a uh, trustworthy machine learning. You know, very interesting. One thing that comes to mind is, at least on some of these aspects that you described with, you know, like, for instance, reliability, you know, there's a need to balance the technical aspects of trustworthy machine learning with social and ethical aspects. For instance, you know, one of my early introductions to, you know, the sort of responsible AI field was an experiment that I was introduced to at MIT, the Moral Machines experiment, which is basically, you know, conducting a set of studies on how humans would respond to different, you know, morally challenging situations. You know, you're driving a car and, you know, you're arbitrating or choosing between sparing the life of one individual versus five. So the classical, you know, trolley car problem in philosophy or in ethics. So, you know, while certain aspects of, you know, responsible AI or trustworthy AI that you mentioned, like fairness, have very clear mathematical formulations that, you know, we can actually pursue and optimize, certain things like ethics or morals are actually, you know, less objective, or they may vary based on personal values or religious values or cultural values. So how do you balance these technical aspects with these social aspects? How do you incorporate different perspectives and values into the actual design and development process? Yeah, no, that's a really great question. And uh, let me first describe one project that we did um, a few years ago and then extrapolate from that. So um, like you're saying, uh, different folks um, do have different value systems. Uh, and uh, it, it's very important, actually, to be able to bring those in in the natural way that they might uh, express them. Um, so a demonstration that we created um, back in 2019 was uh, looking at uh, using the Pac-Man uh, video game as an example. And um, we wanted it to um, kind of have this moral behavior of um, kind of not eating the ghosts, if you're familiar with the game. So what we didn't want to encode it explicitly, because in reality, I mean, like you just said, I mean, there's often not a very clear cut mathematical way to um, bring uh, sort of moral considerations into a system. So what we did was um, we used a technique called inverse reinforcement learning, which is able to take demonstrations of, uh, of the behavior that you want and to induce policies from that. And and so we were able to learn a policy of um, from people playing the game without eating the ghosts of what it means to be kind of moral in that sense. But just that policy by itself wouldn't do the whole trick because we still wanted the system to use its own creativity and um, its strengths as an AI system to um, play really well as well. So what we did was um, we actually had two different policies. We had this moral policy that was induced from in, um, inverse reinforcement learning, and then we had the normal way of doing uh, forward reinforcement learning to play the game to win, um, to maximize the points. And we had this thing which we called the policy orchestrator. So it was using uh, this technology called a contextual bandit. And uh, it kind of, the terminology bandit comes from, uh, actually from Las Vegas. Um, so if you're 
familiar with um, uh, slot machines. They used to be called one-armed bandits back in the <laughs> day. And people, I mean, kind of expanded on that as math problems and called these uh, larger systems multi-armed bandits. And the idea is that you're kind of pulling one machine's arm versus another and um, kind of trying to figure out which machine's arm you should be pulling. So in our case, um, it's should we choose the moral policy or the point maximizing policy? And it was interesting we were able to do this and in the dilemma sort of situations where the ghost uh, where the where pac-man was cornered and the ghost was chasing it it was near this power pellet um it would kind of utilize the moral policy and everywhere else it would use the point maximizing policy so the point that i wanted to make is that um Yes, I mean, we do need to have different ways of bringing in different policies and then use the context, the use case, the specifics of um, what we're doing to inform which policy is the most relevant and what's um, the most important to be done at any point in time. And uh, there's uh, this uh, paper by um, the first author is uh, Abiba Birhan, and um, it's about the forgotten margins of AI ethics. And the point that uh, they make in that uh, paper is that, exactly like you said, I mean, there's different religions, different worldviews, different perspectives, and they're also contextual based on the use case. And um, even the Moral Machines Project saw this. I mean, there was no universal set of morals. So I think they found three big clusters of countries. Um, so I think Asia, and then kind of the English-speaking world, like UK, Australia, US, Canada, and then uh, more of the Southern European and South America sort of cluster. Um, and they had, uh, I mean, very different, I'm mean, not very different, but uh, there were enough differences that they did cluster separately. And um, that's kind of my view right now on um, what's happening with uh, with these large language models. So with, uh, with ChatGPT or with Claude or with Bard or any of these models that are now coming out, they're starting to have these different safety apparatus and they've been instructed in ways to um, limit uh, someone's sense of what's bad, right? But that someone is the engineers in that company. And I think that's the missing piece that we need to work on, which is how do we instruct um, these language models to be able to take principles and policies and um, behaviors, whether they're coming from indigenous knowledge or corporate policies or laws or uh, even psychiatry or other sort of places that inform how things should behave and take them in their natural format and then use those to instruct these language models on how to behave, be contextual about it. So it empowers um, the actual stakeholders, uh, the diverse uh, lived experiences that they have and see to actually um, create the models that work best for them for their deployments and deal with conflicts as well, like in the Pac-Man example that I, that I talked about, because you're going to have, I mean, conflicts, different people, even who are talking about the same thing will have different worldviews. So I think it's important uh, to be able to have those sort of technologies uh, to make sure that the large language models that are now going to be part of our world in a big way um, are actually deployed in, in ways that make sense for the deployers. And in terms of operationalizing, we'll get into the like the LLM sort of side of it, but in terms of operationalizing, you know, these uh, RAI principles, you know, fairness, transparency, explainability, what is actually needed to operationalize them? And maybe some of the toolkits that, you know, you've helped develop with the AI Fairness 360, AI Explainability 360, which I've played around with, play a role. But in production settings, how do you see RAI principles actually being operationalized? The tools are a starting point. They're clearly not the entire solution. Yeah, I mean, when we talk to various people who have uh, worked with our toolkits, it's great to hear that um, they've found them useful, that they're able to um, kind of incorporate them into their natural workflows as uh, practicing data scientists. But there's a lot of education that is needed beyond just having the tools and a lot of organizational governance uh, sort of aspects as well, because the tools without the people and processes um, is kind of sitting on an island. So it's important to uh, have kind of either an ethics board or um, kind of a bottom-up sort of approach in an organization that will help institute kind of policies and make sure that uh, 
as things are being developed, different models, different uh, applications, there is a problem specification phase that involves diverse stakeholders because when people have different lived experiences, they're better able to um, recognize uh, various sorts of harms, uh, especially if they themselves have been oppressed in some way. And so bringing in a, a diverse panel, making sure that you spend a lot of time on the um, problem specification phase, like what is our goal? Why are we doing this? Should we even do this? Um, how would we measure success? If we spend a lot of time on that, then you're in a good spot because then, I mean, a lot of people are skilled to carry out and meet requirements, but setting the requirements themselves is the, the challenge to ensure responsibility. Yeah. So emphasizing sort of this people process technology triad, right? Uh, technology alone is not sufficient. In the context of the actual open source toolkits, two questions. One, how closely do you actually end work with industry practitioners or end users of these tools to help design you know, a tool that can actually address the needs of practitioners? I suspect a big motivation for open sourcing is actually to build community and bridge the gap between you know, responsible AI research and actual AI sort of development, but how closely are you coupling with industry practitioners and end users of these tools in the design and development? So yeah, the motivation for open sourcing was exactly as you said, to bridge the gap between what is happening in both academic and industrial labs um, and the actual practice. So when we first created AI Fairness 360 back in 2018, there was nothing like it uh, around. And so we felt that it was important to um, have the tools collected in a standardized way, matching the syntax that uh, uh, the data scientists tend to use and, and have that. And it was important for us not just to dump some code, but when we first released it, um, we put together several tutorials, um, an interactive web demo, several um, glossaries and re other reference materials and so forth, and created a Slack community as well, um, where anyone can come and ask questions and have discussions. And so we've kept that up over the last uh, five years. And um, yeah, we always get questions from various sort of folks um, on our Slack channel that we address. We've run tutorials at um, uh, several industry uh, conferences as well as academic conferences, getting people up to speed. Um, one nice thing has been since, so we donated the toolkit to the Linux Foundation uh, a few years ago, so it's openly governed, but obviously IBM, uh, IBMers are still uh, very heavily involved. And some of the IBM consulting uh, groups uh, are actually able to then use these toolkits um, along with some enhanced editions of capabilities that are written in the same way, but just haven't been open sourced with a lot of different industry partners. So. They've implemented um, a lot of fairness and explainability and uh, robustness things with companies in the financial services sector and the retail sector in um, all sorts of different different places, um, healthcare and, and so forth. So we have a way to do that that expands the reach of just the, the small number of researchers that were involved uh, to begin with. So yeah, it's been great. I've had a chance to play around with both IBM 3, uh, Fairness 360 and Microsoft has similar tooling with FairLearn. And, you know, I found that these toolkits are actually very effective and powerful tools. And most of the use cases that I've actually experimented with or seen are, you know, supervised learning tasks such as classification or regression. How do we think about using these tools for, you know, emerging uh, technologies like generative AI or LLMs for understanding these notions of fairness or explainability. Are these tools extensible to these kinds of uh, AI technologies, or do we have to rethink the way we build or develop these toolkits to work well for these new technologies? That's an amazing question. It's something that I've been thinking about the last uh, couple of months um, in, in quite a bit, right? So, um, there's certain harms and risks that are the same uh, that are addressed by FairLearn or AIF360 or other things that show up in uh, classification and regression tasks. And if you have a large language model that's being used for a predictive task, then 
a lot of the same tools can still be used, um, especially if they're in the post-processing part of the lifecycle. But then there's a lot of new risks that come up when the output is a generative content, right? So if it's sentences or paragraphs or code or images or whatever have you that are being generated completely new that don't have a, um, a fixed category, set of categories or some number line on which they're being output, then yeah, there's a, a lot of new risks that come about. So things like toxicity, hallucination, lack of factuality, things called prompt injection attacks. There's a bunch of new risks that come about. And all of those are not addressed by these existing uh, toolkits and methodologies. So that really requires uh, a new set of, uh, of approaches to address these new harms that are coming up. So certainly lots of opportunity areas in this space, it seems. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, it's something that we're banging our heads on. Uh, like, what is even hallucination? How do you define it? And then if we can define it, uh, what are ways we can uh, start mitigating I mean, those sort of issues? So yeah, uh, absolutely. And on the toxicity side of things as well, I mean, when this LLM is behaving like a chatbot and interacting with you, there's so many like bad behaviors that it can undertake. Um, I mean, and it goes well beyond the biases that we would um, I mean, count under fairness. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it could be narcissistic. It could be, I mean, bullying you. I mean, doing all sorts of things. And so just understanding, especially from a, like a psychology perspective, that what does it mean for um, these systems to behave in that way and what we, can we do to mitigate it is, uh, is very much uh, an open area. ACM Bytecast is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Podbean, Spotify, Stitcher, and TuneIn. If you're enjoying this episode, please subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite platform. And I think that's a, a good segue to a follow-up question that uh, I was going to raise, which is, you know, in light of some of the rapid advancement of, you know, these uh, LLM technologies, we've also seen growing concern around, you know, harms, around governance, around regulation. As a result, you know, there's been an open letter that's circulating, which I'm sure you're well aware of from the Future of Life Institute which is essentially calling for, you know, a, a six month pause on the development of AI systems. And we've seen this signed by many prominent researchers. And, you know, the letter really cites some of the important risks to society and, you know, humanity at large by these, you know, human competitive AI systems. So what are your thoughts on this call for pause? Do you think it's necessary? Do you think it's feasible? Do you think it's desirable? And I think the sort of the overarching concern is, you know, what's the trade-off between innovation and safety more broadly? Do we stifle progress in this field and, and you know, AI research more broadly? So curious to get your thoughts on this. I guess you've already, I mean, learned that I like analogies and so forth. So let me give you an, another analogy, right? So if we look at commercial aviation, um, so between 1903 and 1958, um, so when the Wright brothers uh, had their first flight and when uh, the Boeing 707 was introduced. So this was a time, the first 50 or so years, where it was all about just trying to get planes to fly, like get, just get them to work, right? And then since the Boeing 707 was introduced, there has not been really a fundamental change in how airplanes work. So today's uh, aircraft are like, extremely similar to the Boeing 707. Um, but what has changed is uh, that in the second 50 years, um, there was uh, much, much more focus on safety and um, efficiency and uh, automation. And so for example, fatality rate per miles flown today compared to the 1970s is something like 300 or 400 times less. And the number of miles flown is, uh, I mean, much, much larger. Right? So is a shift over time where once you have something that is working, then the onus and the focus shifts to, um, uh, to the safety aspects. And we're kind of completing that first 50-ish years of AI as well. So now we have these things. Um, you could say, it was it, I mean, around 2012 when um, deep learning on the ImageNet, was that the end of the first 50 years? Was it when uh, the transformer architecture came about in 2017? I don't know exactly, but we are at some point where um, AI is... Uh, 
is performing, right? Um, it's being used in real world things. So now we are at that point where um, the focus must be on safety. And to me, a complete moratorium is not um, something that helps push, uh, I mean, safety or alignment or um, trustworthy AI research. Um, I think everything goes hand in hand. Um, I do think that there should be more focus and more regulation as well. Um, and when I say regulation, it's not just laws, but regulation through social norms, through the market, through um, through various things that um, kind of make sure that that focus shifts. Um, because again, coming back to the aviation, I mean, if the industry had not uh, shifted to more safety, then it wouldn't be where it is today. Um, and the creation of different uh, regulatory bodies happened, uh, but the market was asking for it as well. So I think this is going to be a natural progression where we kind of, at least that is my hope, that um, that we work towards uh, kind of more of the, uh, the the safety aspects as we as we go forward. And um, just one more comment about uh, the different views of what safety should be about. So there's kind of a long-term view of um, kind of what AI can cause in terms of existential risks to humanity. And then there's, all, I mean, much shorter, clear and present sort of dangers that we see, I mean, every day. And to me, I think that every day things um, that all of us right now are encountering, the bullying from these systems or the fact that they lead to um, unequal um, allocation of things or that we don't, I mean, know what's happening, that there's some incitement of violence or um, other things that these things are doing now um, is where our focus needs to be. So, yeah, I mean... The letter is fine. I mean, it's great that people want to point out that there's risks. Um, I like that. I encourage that. But I think the way to make progress is focusing on things right now that affect people now and um, just kind of making sure that AI research is working towards uh, towards safety. Yeah, I think um, it certainly sparked a good discussion and dialogue within the industry. And, you know, I, I certainly agree that while there are two classes of both short-term and long-term risks, there are very tangible risks that we're seeing in the immediate uh, short-term. And so prioritizing some of those safety and, you know, responsible AI improvements and mitigations, I think, is is certainly of interest. So, you know, in terms of the path forward for governance and regulation, how do you see the role of different stakeholders, whether it be uh, academic institutions, whether it be government, private sector, civil societies, professional societies? How do you see these different stakeholders coming together in that path forward for, you know, AI governance? Yeah, I think everyone, uh, all of those different stakeholders have a role to play. And uh, one big group that you didn't mention was us. I mean, all of us uh, as people, uh, especially people who are maybe less powerful. Um, and uh, yeah, everyone should be bringing forth their principles, their policies. Um, and then systems should be designed in a way that can bring in those kind of policy packs as uh, input to guide and um, kind of control the behavior of, of the systems as they go forward, deal with conflicts, as I was saying before. Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, government regulation has its place. Um, Self-regulation by industry has its place. Watchdog civil society organizations. I mean, civil society kind of exists because, I mean, it is a kind of a criticism to government and industry because if both government and industry were perfect by themselves. There would be no need for civil society in a sense. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, I think everything is important. And I think there's ways to bring all of it together into um, uh, into specifying the, uh, the behavior of these systems. So, you know, as part of this effort, I think one of your major contributions is, you know, the publication of uh, your recent book, Trustworthy, you know, Machine Learning. And I would like to quickly give you the opportunity to plug, you know, this publication where it's available, but I would love to learn more about what inspired you to write this book. Uh, and I'm sure it's a big part of what we discussed, you know, the path forward, how do we as individuals, as practitioners, as, you know, researchers, academics, democratize, you know, this information or this knowledge, but what inspired you to write this book and, 
you know, one interesting thing is you actually chose to, you know, move forward with self-publishing. So what was the motivation with self-publishing and, and how was that experience? In terms of writing a book, I mean, it's obviously a, a very large effort. So it has to be something where the motivation can't be just that, oh, I want to write a book, so I'll write a book. It has to be that you have something unique to say that you don't think that anyone else could say it and that people should, I mean, have a need to hear. And I felt that way a few years ago. Um, this was, I mean, right before uh, COVID um, that I started writing the book. And um, it was kind of that, I mean, I'd had about 10 years of experience up to that point, I had a unique sort of um, way of approaching machine learning. I mean, using the projects that we did through social good, um, uh, also the the client sort of projects, the human capital management, et cetera. So, I mean, I kind of had this unique perspective of this is what the starting point is, also interacting with um, different uh, practitioners, being a, a practitioner partly myself. And so, th I mean, that was the motivation that there was a missing piece that if there's a practitioner who wants to... Um, kind of do things in terms of responsible AI, how do they think about it? What are the conceptual aspects of it? Because to me, a lot of trustworthy machine learning isn't difficult to carry out if you start thinking in the right way to begin with. So that was the goal. So yeah, the book is uh, available as a free PDF on uh, at trustworthymachinelearning.com and it's available on Amazon as a paperback. It's uh, I think $6.85, which is the uh, least possible price that I could set, um, <laughs> given that uh, Amazon has to print it and um, they have some costs for that. So the reason I uh, eventually self-published or independently published is because um, I wanted this knowledge to be out there. Um, so people all over the world should, I mean, have the ability to get the knowledge and to be able to put it into practice. Um, so even like the first week it was released, I got an email from uh, this uh, student from the Ivory Coast. And um, I mean, he just was so like, gushing that, oh, I mean, this is so useful for me. And uh, I've seen that, I mean, again and again, um, that people are dying for knowledge. And if you, I mean, kind of gatekeep and put a book up and it's like $80 or something like that, I mean, like, what's the point? Um Really, what we want is um, people to have the knowledge to be able to use it and uh, uh, to make the world better for themselves and for their communities and, and for everyone. So, I mean, that was the motivation. Um, and uh, I think it's been uh, doing well. So I'm not tracking how many people have the PDF, but um, even in terms of the book sales, um, it's reaching uh, close to a thousand, um, which I think oh, wow. is good for this sort of publication. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's been good for everyone um, that's been able to take advantage of it. And I've personally been making my way through the book and I've so far have thoroughly enjoyed it. So uh, you have one endorsement in me. <laughs> <laughs> and what are some, you know, speaking on the topic of the book, I know we've discussed a lot of the key trustworthy AI principles and concepts, but what are some of the key takeaways that you hope readers will gain or walk away with? I mean, yeah, we've covered a lot of the content through this discussion, but uh, I think the biggest thing is, yeah, I mean, uh, start with the use case. Um, what are you trying to do and why? And is it something that really should be done or not? And then progress forward to um, kind of the, the machine learning aspects, because um Machine learning these days, I mean, there's great tools out there, but um, the question isn't like, how do I use the tool? It's more about um, what is the right thing to do. And um, having that as your starting point, I think is the, the biggest message. And the sort of like theme that kind of uh, winds its way through the entire book is this um, kind of call for people not to take shortcuts um, because I think that's where a lot of the, the issues crop up, um, where they're, I mean, trying to do things very quickly without stopping to think, without stopping to um, think about what mitigations there might be, because um, it's very easy, I mean, to want to take shortcuts. But if you're, I mean, somewhat wanting to be responsible, then, then that's the message. You know, I'd love to quickly touch on some of your work um, with the IBM Science for Social Good. And you provided some pretty, you know, cool context with the motivation. You know, I think you mentioned how you started off with uh, DataKind or uh, Data, was it Data Scientist Without Border? 
Uh, uh, without data quarters. without borders was the original name, borders. and then data kind was the name. Yeah. So you know, given your work with the Science for Social Good initiative and your experience in leveraging technology to, you know, address these pressing societal challenges, how do you think about identifying problem areas to pursue? And what are some of the challenges that exist when you're developing technology solutions for? you know, new markets, new regions, new contexts, you know, developing a solution in the Western world in the U.S. is very different from, you know, developing a technology solution somewhere in rural India or rural Ethiopia, where I'm from. So what are some of the challenges that exist when developing these these solutions in new contexts? So actually, I'm going to be presenting a, um, a, a paper at, uh, at the iClear workshop on uh, practical machine learning for the developing world in a couple of weeks. Um, and the discussion in that entire paper is this, right? So when you're thinking about the developing world and trying to um, uh, develop AI sort of technologies, um, what are the considerations uh, and how should you go about doing it? And in that, I kind of make an analogy again to my favorite thing, to this concept of uh, bottom of the pyramid innovation. So this is the idea that um, if you're, uh, whatever, creating a, a stove or, I mean, any sort of technology product for the developing world, then um, there's a lot of different requirements that come about. And a management professor, um, C.K. Perlad, who came up with this, um, I guess, close to 20 years ago now, um, uh, lists down like 12 different uh, characteristics. Um, I'm not going to go through every single one, but the main things are uh, that you need to start from the user's perspective. So start with the people who you're serving, ask them what is it that they need. Uh, try to understand that as deeply as possible. Um, uh, so in the AI world, I mean, people have started using this term participatory design. Um, so that's, I mean, certainly related. So it's a question of like, really understanding what is the, the true need and then going from there. Because um, what I can imagine sitting in my lab in Yorktown Heights, New York, is very different than being on the ground and uh, kind of uh, experiencing what uh, what is truly needed. And, um, so this bottom of the pyramid innovation sort of approach uh, uh, starts there. And then there's these other characteristics. Um, so the technology needs to be robust, uh, inexpensive, appropriate, have a good user interface um, that's matched to the people. I mean, a bunch of different things and have some reusability as well. And uh, so that they're kind of like more of a platform sort of approach. So all of these things are what in some ways we've been working towards. And actually, I mean, these language models, um, these chatbots um, are almost there in certain capacities because um, now it is true that anyone can uh, really interact with them to solve their own problems. Um, so I had an interesting experience um, in January where this organization we had worked with um, in the past, uh, so it's the Inter International Center for Advocates Against Discrimination. So we had helped them develop some natural language processing technology, which um, marks um, different documents by which of the uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals are discussed in a particular um Sentence. So these, uh, for those that don't know, are um, a set of 17 goals that the member states of the United Nations ratified in um, 2015 as um, things to work towards by 2030. So things like uh, no poverty, no hunger, um, specific um, indicators and so forth. So anyways, um, we developed this NLP thing like five years ago. It took us a whole summer. We uh, I mean, fine-tuned it. Um, there's a bunch of us working on it. And in January, I sat down with the person from that organization. She had heard of ChatGPT by then, but uh, she hadn't thought of the fact that um, Oh, I could solve my problem using ChatGPT. So we sat for two minutes and it just worked out of the box. So, I mean, that democratization is happening. The price point, the environmental concerns amortize um, over a lot of users. So, and it is robust. Uh, we're getting there with low resource languages. Eventually, I'm sure that we'll, we'll be there, um, uh, different interaction patterns and, and so forth. So the thing that is kind of missing though is... Um, the appropriateness in terms of the interaction with other things. Um, so it's not the best right now in terms of um, 
the other tools that uh, the low resource organizations might use. So like if you have some Excel file or something like that, and you want to use that to then interact with um, with one of these chat systems, there's still a gap. Kind of having a little bit more appropriateness in terms of uh, of the integration with uh, with other stuff um, is the missing piece, but we're kind of getting there. Um, so, in my view, we're um, I mean these sort of technologies uh, that we're seeing today are a form of democratization. They do have the robustness to um, work in in hostile conditions and, and so forth. So beyond the actual maturity of the technology itself, you know, in emerging markets, there aren't the same. Uh, financial intense incentives for tech development as there are in developed markets, right? The market may not be as large. The uh, potential for paying for services or products may not be as high. So what do you see as a sustainable model for incentivizing, you know, whether it be large corporations or startups or entrepreneurs to actually drive progress in this area and develop tech solutions for emerging markets? Yeah, so the part that I forgot to mention about this bottom of the pyramid innovation idea is that uh, once you are developing technologies for that large um, base of low resource people or organizations, um, the solutions are often better and cheaper even for the top of the pyramid. So the incentive is, I mean, if you do something really good for that bottom, then it's also really good for the top. So like in India, there's this uh, eye hospital, um, Arvind Eye Hospital, which does extremely cheap cataract eye surgeries. And they've worked it out. So, I mean, they can do so many so quickly and the results are like 10 times better than what you get in the U.S. Um, in terms of the health outcomes. And um and they're like a thousand times cheaper or something like that, right? So when and similarly, like shampoo or like cars or I mean, all sorts of different things. Um, so once you have that uh, incentive that by focusing on the bottom, that you will also be better able to serve the top, then I think that's a, a really great motivation. You know, this has been a very interesting conversation. I'd, I'd love to you know, wrap up by discussing some future uh, directions. I think as we've touched on, we're witnessing an AI arms race and we're seeing a lot of, you know, the rapid evolution and progress of generative AI, which to your point is now becoming a platform where, you know, users can essentially explore different uh, use cases and applications on top of these, you know, foundational models or technologies. So we're seeing conversational AI, we're seeing transformations in search and marketing and education. What are some of the most exciting developments that you see for the future of AI and how do you see these developments impacting the business world in the coming years? Yeah, I'm sure by the time the podcast is released, everything I say will already be done because the um, <laughs> the field is moving so fast, honestly. I mean, it's even someone in my position, it's so hard to keep up. Like every hour of the day, there's some new development. And um, yeah, I mean, I think there's going to be multimodal, um, these models and these foundation models. So um, that incorporate, um, I mean, all the different modalities, uh, image, text, um, tabular data, scientific data, um, I mean, all sorts of stuff. So uh, one combined, I mean, combined models for those, I think that's going to be out there very soon. I think um, to deal with, I mean, some of the risks that I talked about before with hallucination and so forth, um, uh, one thing that uh, needs to happen is uh, kind of separating out uh, the memory, the facts, the information from the processing of the language, because um, right now they can get all mixed together and intermingled. So if we can keep those separately, then we'll avoid some of the um, the issues that we, we see right now. Yeah, I mean, I think just from a business perspective, just the incorporation of, uh, of well-designed, uh, well-grounded sort of systems that uh, are appropriate for uh, consequential applications because um, the state right now doesn't allow these things to um, really be used in, uh, in, in operational sort of settings uh, most of the time because there's kind of this hump that we have to get over um, to make them more trustworthy, more safe um, for, for those enterprise applications. And once we do, I think we'll see a flourishing of, uh, of activity. And uh, one thing that I think that we will also have to think about very seriously is um, 
ensuring that uh, the people have the dignity and agency um, remaining in their work lives um, with these technologies so that it's not the technology is the driver and the human is just along for the ride, but um, there's some, some joint collaboration um, that's designed into the way that these things interact with, with us so that it's utilizing uh, the strengths of humans and AI, but also, um, I mean, giving us um, the dignity of, of work. So AI is a co-pilot. <laughs> yeah, co-pilot or um, some sort of like advisor or um, something like that. Yeah. So finally, what, what advice would you give to you know, young students, researchers, practitioners like myself you know, in the field of AI? And how can they ensure that you know, their work uh, consistent with you know, your personal careers theme contributes to you know, a more just and equitable society? I think... Be solid technically. Um, first of all, um, just like with the trustworthiness, the first attribute is competence. Um, so definitely focus on that and then start bringing in these other attributes. Um, so just like the technology, I mean, has these attributes that we want from it for ourselves, we want the same things. So we want to be leaders um, that are standing on a solid foundation and then bringing in the selflessness and the, um, the justice and uh, and all of those things uh, that go beyond it. So, and yeah, get a, I mean, focus on a broad-based um, education that uh, you're learning everything because I use everything I've learned and everything that I do. Those would be my recommendations. And uh, yeah, just believe in yourself. Believe that what your worldview is, um, is something that uh, that others will value. Well, I think those are some pretty good bites for our audience. Dr. Kushwashne, thank you so much for joining us. I think we are certainly at an inflection point in technology history. And I think with some of the you know amazing and foundational work that you're driving in trustworthy AI and responsible AI, I think the future is, is bright and optimistic. So thank you for all your work and uh, thank you for joining us on this episode. Yeah, it was my pleasure. And I hope it'll be useful for the listeners as well. Thanks. ACM ByteCast is a production of the Association for Computing Machinery's Practitioner Board. To learn more about ACM and its activities, visit acm.org. For more information about this and other episodes, please visit our website at learning.acm.org slash B-Y-T-E-C-A-S-T. That's learning.acm.org slash bikecast.